This is the wonderful reality of being a child of God. We believe that God shows up. God comes. God does. Because what I'm seeing is really upsetting me. So God, come on, show up. When I keep seeking after Him, God's going to show up. God's going to bless. God's going to move. God be magnified. God be magnified. God be magnified. Are you ready to get into the Word this morning? Have you been reading your Bibles? <laughs> it was a very... Uh, <laughs> yes! I trust that you have been getting, uh, you know, strengthened by the Lord because it is only the Word of God that will keep you on the right path. Right now, there are so many things that are happening. You get all kinds of things on the media. You've got to stay focused. This morning after the Tamil service, I was talking to the pastor and one of the leaders. And our authority lies in the Word of God. What Jesus said is becoming more and more real, that man shall not live by bread alone, by all the things that man can uh, uh, you know, come up with, but they can live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. And I trust that you will find strength. We are not having service so that, you know, we are, we are Christians, we must have a service. We are having service because we want you to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. If you keep hearing everything else except the word of God, faith is not going to come. Discouragement will come. Disappointment will come. Confusion will come. But faith in your heart will arise. Faith in good things. Faith in the goodness of people. Faith in God. Come on, amen? All right? When you begin to read the Word of God, you start to see things differently. We'll be talking about that uh, as we go along, all right? Maybe not this morning. But have you ever wondered how it is possible for Paul and Silas who are imprisoned in a dungeon down where the sewerage would flow in Philippi. That's where they kept all the prisoners. And, you know, it would just flow there. And so it's filthy. And they are down there. And they are chained. They have been beaten up, sent to prison. And at midnight, it says, they begin to sing unto the Lord. How is it possible for people to be singing? And this morning, I want to talk about the simplicity of singing in the dark. Now, they didn't have any light at that time, so it is all in the dark that they were singing. We want to learn from David once again. Now, I started by talking about the simplicity of prayer. And I trust that all of you have started to pray. Because listen, if you're going to face the coming year with, with uh, good things happening in your life, in your families, in your businesses, start to learn to pray now. Come on. Pray is not a religious thing. Like we have said right from the beginning, I've said this. Jesus did not come to introduce a religion. He came to introduce to us the kingdom of God. And he wants to allow the kingdom. It is the Father's good pleasure, he said, to give you the kingdom. But how does the kingdom come to my life? When you pray, say, your kingdom come. Your will be Nothing happens until we start to learn how to pray. And one of the best ways to learn how to pray is learning to cry. In other words, to open your, bear your hearts before God and share with Him what you are feeling. Crying out to God. David cried. Jesus Himself cried with strong, loud cries. The book of Hebrews tells us He offered up prayers to God. And so we must learn how to bear our hearts and cry from the depths of our hearts. No point just speaking words into the air. We are not wishing for things to happen. We are not hoping that something happens. We are actually believing that God can be involved. Come on. Just last night we were having, you know, thanks to uh, Sister Visa who took us out for dinner and we were sitting down and having, you know, fellowship after that in the home. And I was, and I was sharing about how God is still... I may not even go into the, the message, but listen to me. God is still involved in this world. He is actively involved. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's. Amen? The earth belongs to Him. It belongs. It is the Lord's. Then it goes on to say, and the fullness thereof which means all the riches that is in this world belongs to him. The fullness of the earth belongs to him. And those who inhabit the earth are also his. 
which means that God, because he owns this entire world and the people and everything that is in it, God is obligated to protect it and to be involved in everything that is happening. Come on, amen? That's why Jesus said, when one sparrow falls to the ground, does your father not know? Now he counts the sparrows. Then he talks about the hair on our head, which I lost quite a few this morning. But God is concerned with the details of this world. The silver and the gold are his, and the cattle on a thousand hills, a thousand hills are his. God is involved in the world. We may not see it. But he can only be involved in the lives of people when they invite him in. When we begin to say, God, I really need, listen, man, the greatest prayer you could ever pray is, God, please help me. God, I need you. You don't have to have a whole vocabulary, you know, one hour. We must pray for one hour every day. We must, come on, man. If you can pray a minute, a minute, a minute each, each moment, Every now and again, God, I really need you. I'm in this massive traffic jam. My blood pressure is rising. I feel like cursing the man next door. God, please, I need your help. That's a good prayer, man. Come on, man. Let's get real. This is what we need. I need help moment by moment. I need his help. Come on, amen. So I talk about the simplicity of prayer. I talk about the simplicity of faith. What, is, what do we have to believe in? We just have to believe in the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. God, you are good to me. You are always good. You cannot be bad. For there is no one good except God. God is a good God. If you watch some of the Africans worshipping God, my goodness, they jump high. And they're going to be jumping. When you watch the drums, come to Punjab, you will understand a little bit about worship <laughs> and loudness. <laughs> they are loud, man. Everything that's happening is loud because worship is loud. It's expressed. And one of the things we saw in Punjab, the things that, that struck me was this. They are so poor, but yet they make themselves worship God. It's like they are being released into great joy. They find tremendous joy in worship. And tears stream down and they are clapping their hands and they are involved. I mean, look at their, fa I look at their faces. There is such joy. And I'm thinking... They are poor, but they find so much joy in expressing themselves and worshiping him. Hallelujah. So David is teaching us all these things, written 3,000 years ago, and he's teaching us still. So this morning we want to go into Psalm 70 and verse 4. And he says this, let all those that seek you, everybody got that verse? Is it there? All right, it's there. Let's read it together. Let all those that seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Let God be magnified. This is a psalm of David while he is going through hell, literally. In the earlier portion of that psalm, he talks about those who are seeking to kill him to hurt him, to harm him. He's crying out to God for deliverance. And then he comes up with this, in spite of all that is happening and, and all the, the, you know, the circumstances he's going through, David comes up with this, let all those that seek you, let all those that love your salvation begin to say continually, let God be magnified. In other words, God I'm going through all these things, but open my eyes to see that you are bigger than all that I'm going through. God cannot become bigger, but I want to see you bigger because the problems seem to be bigger. The situation that I'm in, the difficulties that I'm facing, when I look at them, God, they seem to be so big, but I want you to be magnified. I want you to be bigger than all that I'm seeing because it is so easy in the natural to be caught up with everything that we are seeing and hearing. The more you watch the news, every time you turn on the news, you're looking at the war and the war and the war uh, in Gaza, whatever it is, and people are beginning to take sides. And, and you See, our authority comes back to, again, the Word of God. Is God in control? Absolutely. So I want to see God magnified. 
rather than these things that, that's what I'm saying. If you keep looking at these things, what's going to happen? You're going to become discouraged and you cannot wait to see what's going to happen. Is it going to end? Five different groups had to cancel their trip with the agent that we usually deal with. All of them had to cancel their trips to uh, Israel. So they're all feeling really down because, you know, some of them lost their uh, whatever, you know, they, they bought tickets and everything, lost the agent himself, lost thousands. So, so all these things, and, and people are beginning to think, man, when can we go next and what's going to happen? Listen, keep your eyes on him. Let him become magnified. Amen? But in order to sing like David could sing to the Lord, he gives us the two qualities that's needed in order to be a person who can sing in the dark. First of all, he, he talks about the seekers. Chapter uh, 70, verse 4 again. This is from the Passion Translation. Let all who passionately seek you erupt with excitement and joy over what you've done. That something. Let all who passionately seek you erupt with excitement and joy. In the midst of what he is going through, he's saying, God, as I keep seeking you, let my heart explode with excitement and joy because you are still in control. The world may seem out of control. Friends, whatever you are going through, it may seem to be just so big. But this morning I'm saying, you know, ask God to help you to become Number one, a seeker of him. If you seek after him, he's saying your heart's going to explode with excitement in spite of what's taking place. God is in control. The plans he has for me are good plans. All things are working out together for my good. And I can sing in spite of all that's taking place. Can I hear an amen? But you see, I will not passionately seek the Lord unless... Something about him excites my passion. Unless I know him, I will not seek him. Unless I have heard so many good things about him, I will not seek him. Why did the woman with the issue of blood risk everything going out to touch the hem of his garment? Because she heard certain things about him. That caused her to say, I don't care about anything else. I don't care what people say. I don't care whether I'm penalized by the Lord. I'm still going to go out there because I know that this person can do something. See, our entire faith, listen very carefully now. I was sharing this also last night. Christianity and, and becoming a believer is based on one thing, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be saved and the word saved is entire salvation that covers everything about the kingdom, you and your household. Jesus would always say, do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe? And so when we say, I believe that Jesus came, took upon himself my sin, and I believe that he rose from the dead, and he's making intercession for me at the right hand of the Father, I am saved. It has nothing to do with you repeating a, a prayer after a pastor. That does not save you. It's just words that you are saying unless you mean it from your heart. But if you believe with, inside of you that Jesus is the only one, then the Bible says you are saved. Come on, amen. So what I hear about Jesus, that's why it's important for us to sing songs about Jesus the greatness of Jesus, to hear messages about Jesus, what he is doing. We Again, you know, sharing this with Pastor and, and those at night. I, I, I'm sharing actually with Pastor Lifan. She's my church member. I'm her pastor. So I have to teach her. I was telling her, I said, the problem with the Christian faith, we have what we call the Assemblies of God Cardinal Doctrines. Okay, doctrines. We have the doctrines which is called the Apostles' Creed. Have you heard of the Apostles' Creed? You have the Nicene Creed. This is what it says. I believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he died for my sins and rose again from the dead, and that he is now ascended to God the Father, that he's coming again. Virgin birth, died on the cross. But the Gospels are filled with his life on earth. And we don't talk about that. And the entire life on earth is basically Jesus introducing us to the kingdom. What the Father is like. 
how good he is. He that has seen me has seen the Father. This is God. Your conception, your perception of God must change altogether. And this is what he's talking about throughout the Gospels. We miss that. And we just talk about the reason Jesus came. He came to die for my sins. More than that, he wants to reveal to you who he is, what God is really like. That's why he spent time with sinners, sat down with people, healed the sick, fed the hungry. All these things is to tell us God cares for you. And we miss it. That's why you have to understand and hear messages about, you know, the miracles and Pastor Stefan talk about uh, faith on different levels, what happens in our faith. All the things that Jesus did is to help us see that God is good. Why? So that we will seek Him. And you shall seek me and live. Not continue living like this, but have the kind of life you're meant to have. Say amen. The seekers. And then he talks about the lovers. Let all your devoted lovers, is another way, uh, translation, passion translation. Your devoted lovers, they love you. They love your salvation. Let all those who love your salvation. And what does this entail? What does it mean when we say we love his salvation? It covers a few things. First of all, it talks about they love his person. They love him. I worship you, Jesus. Come on, amen. As often as you come together and partake of communion, remember me. Come on, amen. Not just all the things I can do for you, but remember me as the person. You don't say to your partner, you know, your wife, I love you because you cook well. Because you do this for me, because you do that for me, you do the other for me. And so if the person doesn't do anything for you, cannot love already. You love the person. Can I hear an amen? Come on. Linga, amen? amen. <laughs> you love the person. And so we love Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the giver of all life. He is the author and finisher of my faith. He's the, one, he's the lily of the valley. And he's the one, you know, who has saved me, the rose of Sharon, the one who has become wonderful and beautiful to me. What a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name he is. it is. Amen? The name of Jesus. So we love him because of his person. We love also his passion. We suddenly realize that God loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. He loves me. And this is the message you must understand. Not he loves me because, but he loves me in spite of. Come on, amen. He saved me while I still was a sinner in rebellion to him, against him. Paul the apostle talks about this all of the time. And he talks about the great love that God has loved us with. John the Apostle writes and he says in, in 1 John, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that he has now made us his children. We who were afar off, Paul says, we were, uh, we were cast off from him. We were battling him. We were rebels. We had enemies in our minds, enemies against him. He broke down the wall all because he loves us. Greatest verse of all, for God so loved. God is for us, never against us. This must sink deep down into our spirit so that I can come to him at any time and know that he will embrace me with his arms. I'm preaching this to myself. I have to tell myself, God, I can come to you at any time. He said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out anyone who comes to me. The wonderful story of the prodigal son, you know, I, I had a dream last night. <laughs> I shared with Pastor Life on the dream. I won't tell you the details of the dream, but one portion of it was I was in the presence of a king. And uh, actually I had prayed for a certain man and the man got healed. Hallelujah. <laughs> that was good. And then uh, the, the king kind of heard it and invited me to dinner. And I was sitting with him, with, together with other people. Then he looked at me and he said, you come and see me, huh? This is how he spoke exactly. 
You come and see me, huh? So you know that the king is a local king, right? <laughs> you come and see me, huh? Then you never wear shoes. I didn't have shoes on. And then later on, you know, he asked me to do a few things uh, together with him and then also help him and then he got healed. Then he looked at me again and he said, hey, he wanted to have, he, he, he threw a big dinner. I was the honored guest. Amen, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. <laughs> All right. So, and, and again, he looked at me and said, hey, David, you, you, every time you come and see me, huh, you never wear shoes, huh? And one of the things I felt the Lord was saying to me was, you will always be my son. But remember that you, are, you must also learn how to humble yourself. When the prodigal son came in, the first thing the father did was say, give him shoes. Why? Because the son came back as a servant. He said, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me your servant. The servant does not wear shoes in the home. Only sons wear shoes. And although we recognize that we are sons, there, there must also be that attitude of, I must remain humble before the Lord because it is He who has blessed me. He who has given, He who has loved me first. I love Him simply because He first loved me. That's what the Bible says. It is not because I love Him, therefore He's loving me. If I don't love Him, He's not going to love. God loves us in spite of. See, His nature is love. God is love. He's not loving or tries to love us in spite of he is love. He is the incarnation of love. He cannot do anything else but love. You're all very quiet this morning. <laughs> and he, and this, this is a message for each of us individually. I have to tell myself that in order to approach him, because sometimes you feel unworthy. Sometimes you feel like you have done things that you, know, you should not have done, and you ask God, uh, you know, you, you are ashamed to approach him, but God wipes away all our shame. And he welcomes us. So they love his passion. They love his plan. And what a wonderful plan it is that we don't have to pay for our sins. God takes care of it. Amen? The whole plan of salvation is such a wonderful plan. How he moves us and brings us into his presence. No man comes to God except the Father brings him. The Holy Spirit draws us. We didn't come to God because we decided, okay, I think I'll go to church and become a Christian. No, no. It was the working of the Holy Spirit that caused us to eventually, caused me eventually to say, I'll give up my rebellion. God, I'll come to you. I need you to help me. This is the working of the Holy Spirit because he who began a good work in me will also make sure that the plan is finished. So God has got a good plan. I love his plan. And because I love his plan, I will keep singing continually, let God be magnified. I love his power. The reason why he came, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy every work of the devil. Not the devil himself, but every work that the enemy has done or has established in our world system, God is able to break it. I trust that you're all praying for Shalom and praying for our church here as well. Amen? The coming year, we share a little bit about the theme that's going to, uh, what theme we are going to have. I believe that God's going to break a lot of things and restore back to us a lot of things that we have lost. Amen. Amen. Much of the things that we have lost, God will restore. But we have to take our responsibility in order to invite Him to act on our behalf. If we don't invite God, if my people will pray, turn from their wicked ways and pray and seek my face, I will intervene. So, may the people of God begin to pray. So, we love His power. He has the ability to destroy every work of the enemy over our lives. Nothing can hold us back. Say amen. Nothing, no power of the enemy can keep us under control. God will break that power. Number five, they love His purpose. And we all know that scripture so well. So the purpose of God, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 6, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The word adoption, unfortunately, we use it in a very loose term. We think like 
So the Jews were the first sons. Then God kind of like gave up on them. And so now he has adopted us. How many of you like to know, find out that you are actually an adopted child? You go like, oh, isn't that wonderful? I'm adopted. That's not what it means. The word adopted here is not like the term we think of. It is actually a legal term and it means this, to select, to accept, to consent, or put into effective operation as in the case of a constitution amendment, ordinance, or bylaw. In other words, now it is adopted into the constitution. We have now been adopted. We have been made legal children. And it says, he predestined us, which means that before the foundation of the world, before there was a Jewish nation, before there was a Gentiles, Christians, whatever it is, God already decided to take us as legal heirs together with Christ. Is that something? So the purpose of God is what? And I love that purpose. I have already, long before I was born, God decided that I was going to be brought into as a child of God. Say amen. amen. All right. So we talked about the persons and then we have the proclamation. And David is now proclaiming. He's saying, I will sing in the dark. I will keep singing. Let God be magnified. I will sing continual, continually, continually rejoice. Let all those that seek you. Another translation says, let God be magnified. Let God be magnified. Let God be magnified. Three times. Just like God saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never, 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 never. Five times in the original. I will never, 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 never leave you nor forsake you. Here, David is saying five, uh, three times. God be magnified. Let God be magnified. Let God be magnified. See, you've got to say it until it becomes reality. Let them say continually until God is magnified above what you're facing. It's a proclamation that you must be, ma must be making. God be magnified. God be magnified. God be magnified. Because what I'm seeing is really upsetting me. So God, come on, show up. Show up, God. Come on, amen. This is the wonderful reality of being a child of God. We believe that God shows up. God comes. God does. Amen? He does things. And the reason why I keep saying that is because God saved me. And secondly, because God likes me. I've said this before. God calls us to love everyone. But there are some people we just don't like. We, no, I love you. I, I love everyone. I wish that everybody, I pray that everybody goes to be with the Lord. But there are certain people you just don't want to be around with. Certain people you like to be around. God, no. Why well, you're looking at me like so strange? Oh, you're pastor, okay, no. You must love everybody equally. Sorry lah. I love everybody. God so loves the world. But there are people who will perish without him. He loves them. He's going to love a lot of people all the way down to hell. But he loves them. He wants them to change. Come on, amen. But what I, I, I enjoy about this is God likes me. He likes my presence. He likes it when I talk to him. He likes it when I do good things to other people. When I help somebody out, God likes that. I like it when you do this. I like it when you do that. Come on, say amen. God likes what you're doing. We don't realize it, but God actually likes you. And he leaves blessings to follow you. I will bless you and I, the blessings will come after you and overtake you. That's what it says. The blessings will come upon you and they shall overtake you. In other words, they are waiting for me in my tomorrows before I get there. God likes you. Say amen. That's why I can sing in the dark. Because I know that all things are going to work out for good. 
I know that God's going to show up when I seek after Him. Come on. When I keep seeking after Him, God's going to show up. God's going to bless. God's going to move. Amen? Like I said, the only ones that can, seek, uh, can sing the song are the seekers. All right? And then also those who would begin to love God. Love God. Seek after God and love Him. And I am praying this morning that the Holy Spirit will help us to love Him. This morning as we were singing, I was just saying, you know, singing about Jesus, be, exalt, be magnified, Lord. I was just saying, Holy Spirit, help me to magnify Him. Because the Holy Spirit comes to lift up Jesus. And so I have to say, Lord, I really want to magnify Jesus. Help me, Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad you have the Holy Spirit with you? Amen. And He is here this morning to cause Jesus to be magnified above your problems, above your situation. He's going to open your eyes to see God is in control over everything. If I care for the sparrow that falls to the ground and I saw it fall, I would also take care of you, O ye of little faith. Learn to sing in the dark. Amen. Stand with me.